Hey everybody, final thoughts time for Venice. And um, folks, this is probably the best pickup and delivery game I've ever played. Let me just cut right to the chase. Uh, and that's saying something. Because personally, I am not a fan of pickup and deliver. And neither is my wife. Neither of us find ourselves generally enjoying uh, the, you know, the basic flow of a game which is all about you having an avatar in the world, having to move slowly but surely to some location, get some resource, and then slowly but surely move it to some other location and drop it off. I mean, it just feels like work. Uh, you know, or my, or my wife says it feels like busy work. And um, it's very, very rare to find one that doesn't have a lot of extra stuff. Um, you know, you know to, to kind of jazz it up, to actually elevate it to be something that we would really enjoy playing. Venice does not suffer this problem. This is a pure pickup and deliver game, but um, you know, and it doesn't hide its pickup and deliver roots with other things. And uh, you know, it it just wears its uh, you know heart proudly on its sleeve. It says, "I am pickup and deliver. Respect my authority," and I do. It's it's fantastic. And now maybe that shouldn't be a surprise because this is um, a design collaboration from two. Awesome designers, uh, Dave Turchi and Andre Novak. And you know, Dave Turchi, he's super hot these days. Andre Novak, he was really making a name for himself a few years ago, but he's kind of stepped away, kind of went on a extended vacation from design, I guess. But he's back now. He's working with Dave, and the two of them have made something really special. And what makes this special? How does this stand head and shoulders above all the other um, you know pickup and deliver games out there? There's a couple of things that are really unique about it. Um, one is the fact you've got two trucks or gondolas in this game, and you are required to juggle them. Um, it, this is not a game where, oh, I've just got my one, and I'm going over here, and I'm going over there, and okay, I got it. Now, I know what my next returns are. Move over here move over here, and drop off. Oh, I mean, this game, it's such an interesting puzzle to constantly have to switch back and forth between the two. To have one zip off over there, get something for the sole reason of the other one then just swinging by on the way and you know, doing a little swap to transfer goods back and forth to each other so they will finally get to the destination. So that wrinkle in and of itself, just that one thing, so elevates this above the vast majority of pickup and deliver games that are on the market. I love it. But then on top of that, at any given time, usually having two or three missions that are probably going to take you to different spots, and when you complete those missions, get permanent special abilities. So it's not just, oh, I finally got this done so I can get some points, yay. But no! Oh my gosh, I've become more powerful now. Because this game has such a wonderful acceleration arc. You start off, admittedly, doing very simple stuff, not really moving very far because you don't have a lot of money and you're trying to keep um, you know, keep under stuff under control, avoid traffic jams and stuff like that. But as as you get more money, as you start completing objectives and getting these special powers, you become, you know, a delivery superstar. Um, you know, just zipping all over the canals of Venice, lickety split, and, you know, by the end of the game, what you will do in a given turn is so... Not only because you got the special powers, not only because you've got a lot more money to spend, but because every time you visit a building, you're also visiting your assistants who you've deployed in those buildings. And this is kind of kind of a worker placement thing. It's not really quite like anything else. It's If you have activated these buildings to deploy your assistants there, you always want to go back to those buildings so that you can leverage what they're going to do for you. But not only that, they will upgrade so they become more powerful. And you are heavily incentivized to revisit the same buildings over and over again so you can get more and more resources. But by the same token, you are heavily incentivized to get your uh, assistants spread far and wide. Um, because there are rewards to be had for the more assistants you have on the board. And more importantly, if you just don't have time, look, I don't have time to go to the storehouse. That's not what I need. I'm just going to zip right on by. As you zip on by, you'll activate your assistant passively. So again, near the end of the game, when you've got 10 or 15 bucks and you don't mind spending half of it to go from one side of the board to the other, and you travel a path um, that is going to have you travel by your other assistants, activate them, get to where you ultimately need to go, trigger that, you just get amazing super powerful turns that just are very puzzly and maybe a little bit AP prone. I mean, as the game goes on, it, it, there's a lot to juggle here, but in a really good way. And it's a very, very impressive design all the way around um, from start to finish, from soup to nuts. Um, now, this is the positive. I really like it. Like I said, it's super rare for us to find a pickup and deliver game that we will actually keep. 
Um, and this is a keeper for us. Good job to uh, Dave and Andre. Now, oh man, I didn't even show you so much. I didn't show building bridges so that when you um, build a bridge, you get a discount for moving through areas. You don't, you don't have to pay. In fact, nobody has to pay to move through that area. But if other players move under your bridge, you get passive points. The interplay between players in this game is really fantastic. And now, I admit, I was a bit nervous going in as of two-player game, because there is this potentially quasi-cutthroat thing of the smuggler, who you can use to move around and mess with your opponent. But a lot of the time, if you watch the run-through, it is much better to use the smuggler to upgrade yourself, to give yourself more benefits. And even still, it's only the negatives you can apply towards each other. Just getting a little bit more intrigue is hardly anything. Until the end of the game comes and you realize, oh my gosh, the game's almost over, and I've got seven intrigue! And the Inquisition will come and take me away if I can't get rid of this. So before the game is over, i got to have enough money and or, um, uh, you know, ideally scrolls. Because scrolls are worth nothing. You want to use you use your knowledge at the end of the game to talk your way out of the Inquisition. Um, because you don't want to use your money. Because money is worth points too. So there are so many interesting... Um, trade-offs and compromises you're going to make with yourself to try to come up with an ideal move. Never mind the fact that as the game goes on and the board just gets full of all these meeples, it's just a wonderful sight to behold. It's just a, it's something you want to play with. So, I mean, just point after point after point, this game is fantastic. Now, there, I'm not going to say it's perfect, though. Um, I, I think there will be definitely some things that some people are bothered by that I agree with, some that I don't. One big one is the, the board itself. This board is, I think, objectively smaller than it should be. Because the problem is, as you can see, I'm only maybe all approaching halfway, a halfway point of this game. This board is getting full. And a four-player game, I imagine it would get even fuller because every uh, building can have four meeples um, you know, in a given area. And it is a small board. This board, in a perfect world, would have been 30% bigger. So, because the big problem is, um, let me go back to the overhead view to kind of show it off. That's not the overhead view. That's not the overhead view. Here's the overhead view. You will notice as I'm putting my uh, workers down, I'm putting them around the buildings, and that has caused me to occasionally have to put them like on the score tracker. Um, or, you know, when you have buildings that are really close to each other, is he in this building or this building? Because here's the thing officially, you're supposed to put them on the buildings because it's such a tiny board. But if you do that, you can't see what the buildings do. So you have no choice. You have to put them beside, which means you have to kind of, you know, spread things out a little bit. And yeah, you might have a few meeples on the score track because if you put it here, you can't quite see what he's going to do. That's unfortunate. If this board were 30% bigger, that would have been handy. Also, not only for the meeples, but for um, the boats and the canals too, because, you know, I mean, as multiple boats pull into the same building, it's really important to keep track of who got there first. And so if you line them up like this, okay, do something like that. Say, oh, whoever's at the left was their first, second, third. So this player will get two points. This player will get one point. But this is kind of clumsy. Trying to squeeze three boats into a, into a canal that's only one boat size. Now, here's the interesting thing. I actually saw early pictures of this game. This game was designed so you could stack the boats on top of each other to make room. But I'm sure the developers realized, uh, yeah, that's not going to work. So you just have to kind of squeeze them in. And you know, this does not affect the strategy element of the game at all. Make no mistake, but it is a direct impact on the playability. The game is fiddly. Trying to get your meeples in, you know, around the buildings so that you can still see what the buildings do, even if that means they have to, oh, well, to fit in here, they either have to be out in the canal or they have to be on the uh, council track, one or the other, so, to make room for all of them so that we don't literally cover up the tiles themselves. Trying to get multiple boats onto one space, that's a little unfortunately tight also, and all of this would have been fixed with a bigger board. Don't get me wrong, I like a tiny board. Honestly, one of the cool things about the game is it looks really cool, tiny, because it's so busy. It feels alive in a way that most games don't. But there's no two ways about it. It is a problem. It is unfortunate. Um, my wife and I, we were totally willing to do it. And don't forget, if we play as a two-player game, we're really playing a three-player game. And so, and we just kind of made up with it. Also, I love the design of these gondolas. I just love this idea. But and you know, and, and you put your little gondolier. He's got the little spot. But it is very easy as you're moving around for the, the number of times. I mean, it happened several times while I was doing the run through. As you're moving around, and oh, the gondolier fell out. Again, it's. It's a great, wonderful idea. It's it's atmospheric, it's moody, it's very cool, but it's also a little fiddly. So that's something, if you're the type of player who's really bothered by these things, you'll probably be bothered by it here. For us, the gameplay is so good, we'll put up with it. Um, so... 
Good news, everyone. I was just informed by designer Dave Turchi that there is an expansion coming for Venice that has to do with Leonardo da Vinci, which is implicitly cool in and of itself, but apparently this expansion will also include a new bigger board, which uh, pretty much you know, uh, deals with my number one issue with the game. So that's very, very cool. I'm not sure if it's going to be available direct to retail or if it's only via direct orders because it was an add-on in a recent uh, fundraising uh, Kickstarter campaign that the publisher did. So if you want to know how to get it now, because it might be a limited edition expansion, I'm not sure, you can follow the links down in the show notes that will take you to the page where you can order the Venice Da Vinci expansion. All right. That's one thing to bear in mind. The other thing that I think might be bothersome for some folks, too, is there's a higher than normal percentage of little rules that are easy to forget. The, you know, the hallmark of Euro design for so long has been fewer rules. Um, you know, simpler, cleaner, more elegant space. This game, though, has different rules for how you move around. Oh, if you end up in a space with your opponent's ship versus your ship. If you move through a space with one of your assistants, well, is there one of your other your other gondola there or not? Um, you know, and then, you know, you, you add the smugglers, they add extra special rules rules itself. So make no mistake about it. The game could be a little bit more elegant, could be a little bit more streamlined. And I wouldn't complain if there were just like one less special case rules to remember uh, about how these ships interact with each other, or the gondolas interact with each other. So that's kind of unfortunate too. And you know, if anybody were to complain about those, I would say, you know what, you're, you're right to complain. These are weaknesses of the game. Um, this should be a bigger board to make the game more user-friendly. And, um, I mean, I get the gondolier. If you want to, the simplest thing is if you've got a cube that matches your player color, just put a cube back there and the, and the cube won't fall out like the gondolier does. But I love the gondolier. I mean, it's just so cool. Oh, he just fell out again. I was just trying to pick this up to move. I mean, this is just a neat component. It's very, very cool. Oh, he just fell down me putting him down. There's no two ways about it. That is going to be something that's going to bother some people. I, I, I do like it. It, it could have been a little bit better. Um, and again, I, I, if the board were bigger, that'd be fine. The extra rules that we have to remember, you know, the rule book does not help. This is a really weird rule book. The order of stuff, um, if I'm trying to go back and try to remember, right, how does this work and how does that work? I have found it very difficult to go back in here and, and find stuff. Uh, and, you know, and I, and I say this, bear in mind, I mean, I read a lot of rule books often. People say, oh, this rule book is fine or is terrible. And I say, I, I can read it. I don't have a problem with it. This one made the game harder to learn and play than it should be. So, I mean, I believe Publisher Braincrack is a relatively new publisher. And, I mean, they've got a crackerjack design here. I'll forgive them a couple of snafus in their production. You know, the rulebook could have been better. The board could have been better. They have a really great, wonderful, ambitious physical design that just, you know, falls a little bit. But, you know, I don't care because it is fun to have my little guy as I zip around and all of that. Even if the board makes it so I'm constantly bumping other stuff too. You, I mean, you'll have to decide for yourself if one of, as far as I'm concerned, you know, for, for Jens and my taste, literally the best pick up and deliver game ever is worth the slight in, um, you know, uh, the, you know the, the, the usability issues. I don't know. Maybe someday down the road it'll get a reprint and they'll make this a uh, six fold board instead of a quad fold board so it can just be bigger. Just a bigger board would have made such a huge difference. But I don't care. I love it anyway. It is so much fun to play. Again, going from zero to hero, the juggling of the two things, everything about the design of this game is phenomenal. And that's Venice, folks. Thanks very much for watching. Have a very nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Bye-bye.